I recently saw Death Street Rides again. What is that? It's a western with Jimmy Stewart in it. Very young, tall, skinny. And it's got Marlena Dietrich. Oh, yeah. In it, and basically the whole Madeline Kahn joke and the blazing from there. Yeah, it's it's from there. The woman couldn't sing at all. It really sounds like she's had some sort of nerve damage on her face when she sings. Was it any good? Oh yeah, it's great. Destry's a hero who uh, who refuses to use guns. He uses folksy stories and knowledge of legal matters. <laughs> He's like an Old West Doctor Who. Why did you watch it? I've spent a lot of time trying to just fill in my Western gaps. That gaps. sounds painful. Yes, yes it does. All over the side. I have a lot of Western gaps. But yeah, I've done uh, Shane in the original 310 to Yuma, and now, now Destry, he rides again. In your Western gaps. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. All the way up through Halloween, we're going to be celebrating cinematic genres here on the show. Last time, you randomly picked a genre from the sealed envelopes, and tonight, we're going to be watching an X-rated movie. Huh? The X rating was created in 1968 by the Motion Picture Association of America simply to designate that a movie was for adults only, not, as many people believe, to label pornography. Pornography actually isn't recognized by the MPAA, and the X rating is not trademarked, which means anybody can use it and put it on any movie they want, including hardcore porn. They also got to make up ratings like double X and triple X, which actually don't mean anything. It means something to me. I realize that. Yes. A lot of these movies were reclassified by the MPAA and given an R rating after their initial release. So I'm guessing that what we are going to see tonight is not going to be too shocking. Midnight Cowboy, if you look at that, that's... A basically a PG-13 movie. That's got a pretty gnarly, like, weird rape scene flashback kind of thing. Okay, so it's a, yeah. it's a light R. I think um, there's swear, there's profanity in it, too. Yeah, well, no, oh, oh, okay, so, but... Nudity? There's nudity? Okay. okay. Well, you said PG-13. Yeah, you were well, wrong. Uh, well, I'm, I'm so... You were desensitized. wrong. Desensitized. Say you were wrong. I'm wrong through desensitization. You can't say it. You can't, can't say, say it. Desentified. You can't say you were I wrong. I can't say desentified. <laughs> So what is the movie that we're going to be watching tonight, you may ask? This movie is of two genres. It's X-rated and animated. Meow! It's Fritz the Cat! Fritz the Cat! Released in 1972, written and directed by alternative animation icon Ralph Bakshi, Fritz the Cat, or El Gato Caliente, as it was known in Spain, is the most successful independent animated feature of all time, grossing over $100 million worldwide. Whoa! Okay. This is the easy writer of cat sex movies. <laughs> <laughs> Loosely based on a character by underground comic artist R. Crum, Crum was not a fan of the finished product, saying, quote, it's really twisted in some kind of weird, unfunny way, unquote. Ooh, unfunny. Yeah, can't I can't wait. wait to see. You may not know this, but I have a little gift for you. Really? I do. A strange turn of events? I couldn't find any Fritz the Cat swag, so I decided to go with another The Cat. Enjoy. Oh. It would be... Felix the Cat! Oh, no! Oh, that's how we talk, right? I don't know. No! <laughs> was that what he did? I don't know. All I know is that oh, his, his, little, his little eyes go back and forth. <laughs> you really like that little guy. Yeah, he's adorable. All right, all you cool cats and sex kittens, slide on over with us to the old leather couch for an evening of feline debauchery with Fritz the Cat. <laughs> Meow. family, how you should look and act, and they sent him to college. I mean, sure, pig construction workers, but hippos? Three construction workers are talking about stuff, and one of them pisses off the side and gets a hippie on the head with his urine. What a drag, man. Fritz the Cat is hanging out in Washington Square Park with his buddies. They play their guitars and try to impress the ladies. One of us should have learned the bass. Fritz decides to split and catch up with the ladies. What can I do? Lovely set of eyes there. The old balloon squeak breasts. <laughs> Little boob squeezing. And he convinces them to go with him to a swinging pad. Where there's a big old drug smoking going on. They go into the bathroom and have an orgy in the bathtub. This isn't turning me on at all. No. Things are going pretty well for Fritz until all the hippies in the next room come in and decide to join in. Then Fritz gets sad. But he decides to just get high. I'm a failure as a pot smoker. He's like Clinton. 
But uh oh, the cops show up. They're pigs, obviously. Uh, hey, 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 Ralph. This is, I think this is the place we got And they've the had massive head trauma <laughs> yeah. at some point in their lives. Cut it out. I won't laugh. I won't laugh. I'll put it Ah. Just like Sarge from Beetle Bailey. We'll jump on him till he squiggles. <laughs> they bust in on the party. And Fritz hides in the toilet. Train spotting. Fritz gets a hold of one of the cop's guns and he shoots the toilet, causing a tidal wave of water to wash everybody away. Fritz hides out for a little while in a synagogue, and then he goes back to his dorm room at NYU. Hey, Buzz, how'd it go with a DD chick, huh? She got some bod, huh? Everyone's so square there, studying, nose in the books, while the world is passing you by. Think about it, Craig. I know. The lesson. Stop reading. And Fritz is like, this isn't life. I want to go out there and live life. He starts a big fire and drops out of college. Fritz the Cat is a movie without plot. Dun, 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 dun. Take it. <laughs> Fritz is going off to live life, and he knows where to start. Harlem! Fritz goes to a bar full of crows who certainly aren't meant to represent any particular ethnic group. Fritz doesn't fit in too well with the crows. It's just very it's difficult to even say. He meets a pool-playing friend named Duke. Well, just don't lose your coolness, cat. I mean, don't lose your coolness. In a normal cartoon, this is where the singing would begin. Who decides to take him to a brothel. You stealing that car? Hey, <laughs> shove over, Jack. Penis! Act like you never saw a dick in church. <laughs> that you, Sonny? Yeah, it's me, baby. But it sure ain't like the good old days in Harlem. And... The days of the Harlem Renaissance when we wrote all that poetry. That was before all those peace marches, sit-ins, riots. Back when we used to hang out with Zora Neale Hurston. <laughs> Oh, Fritz is happy to be there. After smoking many simultaneous joints... Hey man, let's get the cat high. That would be hysterical. He chases a large prostitute through a junkyard. In the middle of having sex, Fritz has a revelation. There needs to be a revolution. I must tell the people about the revolution! Trite, philosophical, hippie mumbo-jumbo. He goes to Harlem and gives a rousing speech. Revolt, you thick skull idiot! and he incites a race riot. Duke gets killed in a moment that's actually kind of dramatic if it was in a completely different movie. Once more, Fritz is on the run from the cops. Where could he be? Laddie Hurst. <laughs> <laughs> he meets his friend Winston. Fritz! Good evening, madam. <laughs> I'm like that Cat Stevens album cover. She suggests they move to San Francisco and get married. And Fritz goes along with it. Because he's just along for the ride, man. Meanwhile, out in some fleabag desert motel, a Nazi junkie rabbit is shooting up. Nazi rabbit make love to horse woman. <laughs> You know you like heroin. The way to a man's heart is through his collapsed veins. <laughs> they drive across country, but then they run out of gas. They meet up with a chicken farming dog. Fritz and his girlfriend get in an argument. She gives him a bucket for some gasoline. I don't know what he's supposed to do with that. And he leaves her by the side of the road, because being with a chick is a drag. Hey, you old scroungy old... Alley cat, get out of them garbage cans, ha huh? Talking to me, Jack? Fritz meets up with a bike-riding bunny named Blue. I can't think of anything to do. Well, offhand, son, I'd say you have got a problem, yeah. ha ha. But at least you're honest, the revolution can use a man like you. Takes him down to his anarchist den, where there's a Scooby-Doo phantom person. Well, what's the state of his political consciousness? Is that uh, Russell Brand? <laughs> Sounds like Russell Brand. And they have a big load of dynamite, and they're going to blow up the local power plant. 
but Fritz is starting to become disillusioned with this organization and with being a revolutionary in general. I ain't planned this bomb for you schmucks. So long, Fritz. But too late, the fuse is already lit. Far out. Fritz the cat is dead. Or is he? No, he's in the hospital, wrapped in bandages, like any good cartoon character would be. Fritz's ladies come to see him. Fritz has a few last words, and then they all have sex, because I guess he's okay. It's kind of a cartoon ending, I guess. Fritz the Cat. Groovy or a stone cold bummer? That was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life. I think one of the main problems with it is that it didn't have a lot of the essential qualities that movies tend to have. Or stories tend to have. Right. It just had scenes that came from nowhere and went nowhere and seemed to be there for no reason. I imagine it was supposed to play out like a series of short comic books where it's like, oh, this is the bit where there's the orgy in the bathtub, and this right, is the bit right. where he's at the pool hall in Harlem. Like a movie of, made up of comic strips. Yeah, but sure. you still have to have a beginning, middle, and end of those scenes, and a certain amount of logic behind it. Fritz does have a character arc. Yeah. And he seems to go through a change at the end, but it's sort of negated by the jokey ending. He doesn't kinda, change at all. Which kind of renders everything pointless. Yeah, but you can say the same about Tony Soprano. He doesn't really change in the course of that show either. But still, that's the point of The Sopranos. We were supposed to think that the filmmakers at least had empathy for these other worlds that he went into. Because if you look at the closing credits and it's all those photographs of Harlem and New York City, this is the world they wanted to show. But it was nothing but stereotypes on top of stereotypes. When they'd go and see black people or hippie people or anything, or just, Cops. It, I could be Rodney King and I'd be like, man, they really made <laughs> cops look like the stupidest people alive. When you're offended by how cops are portrayed in a hippie movie, that it shows how bad it is. But, I mean, look at the way the hippies are portrayed, though. I mean, the, the opening image of the movie is a construction worker taking a leak on a hippie. That has to be sort of like a, a mission statement for the film. And really, the film does seem to be sort of an indictment of that kind of 60s counterculture, where revolutionaries are really just evil people who want to hurt people. Or and, they're just a bunch of stoners doing nothing. Right. And Fritz, you know, doesn't really belong in either world, and his journey is still continuing. You have to admit the, the visuals are pretty inventive and at times quite striking. There are moments like the reflection of the windows or the tombstones on a tear. That mm -hmm. was amazing, but it didn't really work in the movie because the things around it didn't work. The movie is really joyless. Yeah. It has no soul. I... Well, what did work? It just comes down to various visuals, like those beautifully rendered shots of Washington Square or Los Angeles at the end of the movie. But those shots go on for so long. It's kind of like Bakshi saying, it's like, hey, I made this really pretty picture, everyone. Just look at it. There seems to be a lot of filler. The satire almost entirely falls flat. Is that just because it's dated? No, it's because the comedy doesn't work. It's like, hey, we're cops and we're gonna jump on each other for a while because we're angry. Well, it's not the, satire, it's not funny. The movie was never funny. Never That's, funny. Yeah, no, not one laugh. No. I don't think I've ever seen a comedy that's completely devoid of anything resembling comedy. Calling this movie unfunny is kind of like criticizing it for not being a table. <laughs> and I imagine that people in 1972 who were really stoned probably laughed quite a bit. Any artwork where you have to be stoned to like it is not good artwork. Right. If you're stoned and listening to The Doors or reading our Crumb comics, you know, you're probably going to find them transcendent. But they'll also be good when you're not stoned. Yeah. And this movie, I don't think that's the case. No. They obviously, whoever made this, obviously loves African American people, but... They don't know how... They're, they're like Fritz. They're like, hey, I love black people. I'm going to make you a bunch of crows and drunks and violent and, and horrible. And they sure. obviously love women, but they're only these things to have sex with. Could you see that again as an indictment of the free love generation? Fritz is behaving this way because the creators of this film see that behavior as reprehensible. The act towards the end of the film is is meant to be seen as the horror that it is. And it actually makes... Fritz sort of have a change of heart. So does that mean that the film does have an inherent morality to it? It tries. It, try, it tries. Yeah. And once again, like in most things it attempts to do, it fails. It fails, yeah. yeah.
I think we need to call in an expert to talk about this movie. What did you think of Fritz the Cat, Ernesto? What did you think, buddy? He ran away, and I feel a little bit like running away, too. Yeah. That was Fritz the Cat. Not as much fun as a cartoon should be. Don't take our word for it. You should watch Fritz the Cat for yourself. You don't have to watch Fritz the Cat. You really don't have to watch it. There's other things you can do for 76 minutes. Make a flip book. Make your own version of Fritz the Cat. Anything. Take a nap. Rosie up those cheeks. Oh, lordy. <laughs> you can also check out our website, welcome to the basement show.com. There's a PayPal button there where you can make a donation to support this show. Some of our recent donors include Candace, who gives us a thumb kiss. Right back at you, baby. Carl, Brian, Evan, Michael, who says the show is excellent, happy to support it. George, Casey, Raymond, Chris, and Jennifer, who I know has got a little crush on you. Oh, hey Jennifer. Hello. Poker Joker 811 writes, Doesn't Craig's talent bomb analogy basically refer to every Gary Marshall movie in the past five years? I don't know, I've avoided them myself. Last episode, Craig came up with another uh, original term called Talent Bomb, and we thought we should come up with an official definition. A movie featuring a wealth of great actors and directing talent and is basically a can't-miss cinematic proposition. Yet the movie somehow ends up being hubristically terrible. I remembered another one, a movie I saw with you years and years ago, The Last Tycoon. Robert De Niro, directed by Elliot Kazan, based off of F. Scott Fitzgerald's last novel, and Harold Pinter wrote the script. And it's a mess. It is. It's yeah. very boring. Any movie where the movie poster has a bunch of little pictures on it of all the people who are in the movie, yeah, that's probably going to be a talent bomb. So uh, you were in a podcast recently? I was. Uh, Rob Matsushita, who you might recall, picked out our Bedazzled episode. Our good friend Rob. He has a podcast called... 10 Minutes About Your Favorite Movie. You can go to littlepodcast.com. Him and I talked uh, for 10 minutes about one of my favorite movies, which is Martin Scorsese's After Hours. I'm looking forward to listening to it. Hey, Rob, I'll be on your podcast. Give me a call, buddy. I said that like Pauly Shore. Yeah, <laughs> you did. And now it's time for Seen It, man. Seen It. <laughs> <laughs> You might recall, during season one, we did a salute to bottle movies. Well, tonight on Seen It, it's the return of the bottle movies. A bottle movie is a movie that takes place entirely in one location. A lot of our viewers suggested their own favorite bottle movies. Well, Craig and I went and watched a whole bunch of them, and we're going to talk about them right now. Here we go. Kush Links writes, The movie Tape, directed by Richard Linklater. The whole thing takes place in a tiny hotel room. Seen It. This is the one Mad watched without me. Because you hate Ethan Hawke. That's right. Some may say an irrational hatred of Mr. <laughs> Hawke, and so he wouldn't watch the movie with me. But I watched it, and I liked it. Very well acted, obviously. I thought Linklater's use of whip pans was really annoying and distracting. He would do these, he'd whip the camera around, and it made me so conscious of this stylistic camera thing that I forgot about what the characters were talking about. So that part really annoyed me, but the rest of it was really good. I should check it out someday once I get rational. The most suggested bottle movie from our viewers was a little movie called this. <laughs> the Man from Earth is the best bottle movie of all time. It changed my life, says Batosai70. Apocalypse Eep writes, The Man from Earth is a bottle movie. I liked it. You may or may not like it. <laughs> Seen it. <laughs> Seen it. And I think that's the perfect description of The Man from Earth. You may or may not like it. Yes. This is the most thought-provoking bad movie I've ever seen. <laughs> really? Yes. I, I wouldn't call it a bad movie. The only thing that really got me down is it has the old uh, an old sci-fi show's tendency towards two-dimensional characters. Yep. Some of the acting is really awful. Uh, it features William Cat with a ridiculous soul patch <laughs> and ponytail. <laughs> it's an intriguing movie. It's something that I think... Everyone should check out on their own and make up their own mind. You're not wasting your time by watching this movie. The cinephile in you may hate this movie, but the curious intellectual in you will definitely be interested in it and may even love it. Twelve Angry Men is a great bottle movie, says Laughing Owl Killer. Classic movie from the 50s, Henry Fonda, and 11 other people you recognize from old black and white movies. I think I saw this movie in the same high school history class that we watched And Justice for All in. Oh. He was really into showing us movies. He was one of those history teachers that was also a gym teacher. I don't remember. His, his name was Mr. Hughes. He would, like, mention a movie, and he would say, Have you guys seen that movie? And we'd be like, No. 
You'd be like, all right, we're going to watch that movie. <laughs> it should still be shown in high school history and civics classes. It still holds up. A movie about justice and about racial tolerance. Yep, the, the only Two th- things that Fritz the Cat <laughs> was not about. Christopher Eggers writes, A bottle movie that I enjoyed is The Sunset Limited. It was an HBO film starring Tommy Lee Jones and Samuel Jackson based off of a story by Cormac McCarthy. Just two characters in a room. Very captivating. Seen it. Seen it. This is what great actors should be doing. It's just two characters in a room. And they're duking it out with their acting. Tommy Lee Jones' final monologue in that movie is so good that I almost think that he might have been the devil <laughs> sent to destroy a man. Sunset Limited, go and see it. It's, it's, they're in an apartment, it's Tommy Lee Jones, go see it. Eli Kendra, which is the name of my nephew and my sister, says, I say go Canadian for a bottle movie. Pontypool, 2008, is a great thriller that takes place in a radio station. Seen it. Seen it. It's a very interesting take on the particular genre that it belongs to, and I'm not even going to say what that genre is. No. You just watch it and find out for yourself. You know what I love? Canadian movies. They exist. They're up there being watched by Canadians. Occasionally one will seep down and I'll find one. It looks like an American movie and sounds like an American movie, but it's definitely a Canadian movie. It sort of goes up its own ass a little bit in the third act. Yeah. Kind of falls apart under its own logic. But uh, up until that point, it's really, really good. Humpty Pool. Stop it. You're giving it away. Stop mm. it. Okay. You're not going <laughs> to... That was Seen It. And that's our show. Thank you so much for joining us. We love to do this show for you fine people. Go to welcometothebasementshow.com and kick a few dollars into the PayPal fund. Put in comments asking if we've seen movies, and maybe we have seen them. I know that a lot of you leave a lot of comments, and I don't always get to them. Keep leaving comments. You know what time it is now. It's time to pick the genre of the movie for our next episode. (laughs) I got a bunch of sealed envelopes here. And I have a letter opener here. Is that a letter opener from actress Catherine Grant, who you were in a play with in Rice Lake, Wisconsin? That's right. Well, now we can open our letters in style. That's that one. All right. So there we go. Still works. Film noir. We're going to take a trip back in time to a reaction to German Expressionism. And the desolations of America's involvement in the two world wars. Very good, Professor. (laughs) Next time, you mugs, we're going to watch a film noir movie. We hope you join us, and we'll see you then. Good night. Good night. And no good deed will go unpunished. Five (laughs) minutes. Damn it. No offense, son. I'd say you have got a problem. Ha ha.